Welcome to National Parks Traveler, where we explore the national parks and the issues that involve them. Bison, which back in 2016 were designated as the national mammal, once numbered as many as 60 million or more in North America, and roamed from Nevada to Virginia and northern Canada down to Mexico. But in the late 19th century, the possibility arose that bison would be wiped off the U.S. landscape. William Temple Hornaday was determined not to let that happen. A taxidermist who had traveled the world over collecting wildlife specimens that could be sold to museums, universities, and even private collectors for exhibits, Hornaday became enamored with bison when he went west to kill one or two for display in the National Museum before the species went extinct. Rather than sit idly by and wait for the species to be wiped out, Hornaday and a young Theodore Roosevelt launched the American Bison Society to work to preserve the species. They did, of course, succeed. Today, there are an estimated 10,000 bison on public lands, places such as Yellowstone and Wind Cave National Parks, and thousands more on private ranches and state parks. Yellowstone, with roughly 5,000 bison, claims the greatest bison population on public lands in the United States. But should Yellowstone have more bison, or should it have less? Just recently, the park embarked on an environmental impact statement to examine that question. We're going to take a look at that today with the help of Dr. James Durr, a professor of veterinary genetics at Texas A&M University, who has spent more than a quarter century directing worldwide research projects in wildlife and livestock conservation genetics. Some of that research has centered on Yellowstone's bison herds. We'll be back in a minute with Dr. Durr to get caught up on bison research in the United States. Acadia National Park is one of the 10 most popular national parks in the United States. It is also one of the smallest and most vulnerable. That is why Friends of Acadia exists. Friends of Acadia is an independent organization of passionate people, inspiring those who love this magnificent park to make a real and lasting difference for Acadia. You can make a difference at friendsofacadia.org. The Everglades Foundation, the only organization whose sole mission is to restore and protect America's Everglades. Learn more at evergladesfoundation.org. Nova Scotia. 8,000 miles of coastline dotted with colorful fishing villages, quaint coastal towns, and an abundance of scenic natural beauty. Home to two national parks, Cape Breton Highlands and Kejimakujik. Spend your nights under a canopy of twinkling stars. Spend your days exploring trails, beaches, historical waterways, and tons of cultural and recreational experiences. Visit novascotia.com today and start planning your natural getaway. The Yosemite Conservancy helps visitors connect with Yosemite through adventures, volunteering, and the arts. It's the only nonprofit dedicated to supporting Yosemite National Park and funds grants to improve trails, restore habitat, protect wildlife, and inspire the next generation of nature lovers. Learn more at yosemite.org. Whether it be strategy, business planning, change management, board development, executive search, or diversity planning, Petrero Group is here to help. They mix a depth of experience in the parks and land space with a breadth of best practices from other industries. For more information or to schedule a preliminary conversation, go to potrerogroup.com, P-O-T-R-E-R-O, group.com. Welcome to The Traveler, Dr. Durr. Thank you, Kurt. I uh, appreciate you asking me to come on. Yeah. Now, back in 2008, then Interior Secretary Dirk Kempthorne launched the Bison Conservation Initiative. At the time, he said that the initiative acknowledges the important role of bison on the landscape, in tribal culture, and in our national heritage, and that Interior would work with partnerships to sustain a strong and well-coordinated conservation effort throughout this country, throughout this century. Now, before we dig too deep into some of the science... Where would you say things stand in regard to Secretary Kempthorne's vision to develop and sustain what he called a strong and well-coordinated conservation effort throughout this country? I think over the years, over the last 20 years or so, there's, there's been a concerted effort to try to understand more about bison and, and conservation of bison from a genetic standpoint and from an ecological standpoint. And and I think the, uh, the advances that we've made in knowledge about bison are, are positive. And I think things are 
much, much better defined today than they were, say, 20 years ago before a number of people had had done some of the studies that we've been involved in. So I think, you know, I don't know that we're on track, but I do know that we're making positive progress. Now, back in 2020, Interior released the long-term viability of Department of the Interior bison under current management and potential metapopulation management strategies. That's that's a mouthful for sure. Um, It's a 115-page report on bison genetics in the U.S. and how best to manage those genetics, if you will. Was there a single key takeaway from that report? I mean, I've been scrolling through it, and and there's definitely a lot of information, um, more than the the layman would understand, I'm sure. But um, was there a key takeaway that we can point to? I think that the realization that the conservation of of bison genetic diversity is an important thing to aspire to. And in order to conserve something like genetic diversity, you have to define what it is. And so since that time, because that's been over 20 years ago now. So since that time, people in my laboratory and other places have spent quite a bit of time trying to document the amount of genetic diversity that occurs in bison in different herds, whether they're federal herds or private herds, or even state herds or tribal herds. Now, when we talk about genetic diversity, there there are a couple of issues that that come to mind. Um, You know, one, the the threat of extinction in the late 19th century was the result of the great slaughter, of course, where there was a concerted effort to um, wipe out bison herds, um, to try and deprive uh, native cultures of, of their commissary, as it's, as it's put, you know, because bison served as food and shelter and countless other um, items for, for Native American cultures. And the, the hope by some was drive the bison out of uh, existence and, and it'd be easier to put the Native cultures on, on reservations. Coming out of uh, or coming into the 20th century, we had maybe two dozen bison in Yellowstone National Park and, and there were some private herds across the the country and in Canada. And these were, I believe, called the the foundational herds, right? Weren't there five or six foundational herds? And if you could explain exactly what those were. Yeah, when we go back to the major population bottleneck time in the 1870s, 1880s, as, as we worked through that time period and got into the 1890s, there were basically five different individuals, five different groups, I guess, that that owned bison, that had bison in private holdings. And these people ranged from southern Canada to Montana to South Dakota to Kansas and then all the way down here to Texas. And for the most part, these guys were all cattlemen. And they were raising bison primarily as livestock. They obviously all were interested in in bison as a species and the conservation of it. But but they were raising bison as livestock. They had taken animals from their local environment, whether it was Kansas, South Dakota, Canada, or Texas, and were propagating those animals. And then also there were a few, and we don't know exactly the number, but somewhere around 20 bison that existed in Yellowstone National Park at that time that, that had survived poaching and that were still found in the park. So there, there are approximately five private individuals in Yellowstone National Park, at least in the U.S., that had bison in the late 1880s, early 1990s, or 1890s. And, and so it's, it's generally accepted that all of today's conservation herds, which are, are herds maintained to keep the, the genetics alive, uh, the pure bison genetics alive, it's thought that all those herds descended from these five or six populations? Yeah, pretty much. As far as the major the major herds that exist in the U.S. today, um, the ones that have been around for a long time, they are traceable back to one of those foundation herds. And so there, it's not to say that there could have been a few stragglers here or there, bison that survived through that bottleneck that weren't part of those five foundation herds. But the vast majority of the herds that were established subsequent to that and after 1900 came from in excess animals that were in one of those five foundation herds. Now, of course, um, two, two of those herds, one was um, owned by Charles Goodnight down in Texas, and another one, I believe, um, Charles Buffalo Jones in Kansas, I, I believe, had, had some of the 
foundational stock. Now, both those gentlemen um, experimented with crossing bison with cattle. And that's how there was a, an introduction of cattle genes into, into bison. And I, I know from literature that, that uh, Goodnight supposedly did a really great job of, of separating his um, hybrid bison from his, his pure purebred bison. Um, I'm not so sure about Buffalo Jones. And so there's a concern about cattle genes entering bison genetics. Is that a great issue today? Well, I mean, clearly, historically, we know that that most most of those guys that had bison in the late 1800s had some interest, varying levels of interest, in producing hybrids with domestic cattle. And people like Charles Jones, particularly, but also Charles Goodnight and others, at one point had the opinion that if you cross bison and cattle, you can produce an animal, a hybrid animal, that has got the characteristics of a bison being really hardy and able to survive well on the landscape, but also the characteristics of meat cattle uh, and production characteristics that might improve uh, meat production. And so these guys were motivated to experiment to try to make hybrids between bison and cattle. And for the most part, they were successful. As a matter of fact, Charles Goodnight published a paper in the Journal of Heredity in 1914 explaining how you make how you make hybrids between bison and cattle. And then Charles Jones backed that up too with another scientific publication about, you know, his experience with hybridization. So these guys over a hundred years ago were interested in it. They were producing hybrids. Um, they were experimenting with it, but the bottom line in the end, Charles Goodnight um, at least admitted that his hybrid experiments were successful in producing animals. They weren't successful at producing a better beef cow, a beef breed, I guess. And so he abandoned those experiments, at least later in his lifetime. And um, I think today, as far as I know, as far as major beef breeds, there are no major beef breeds that claim to have any bison influence in them. Um, but in some cases, though, we're left with the legacy of what those guys did 100 or 120 years ago in trying to produce hybrids to those experiments that they did. Yeah. Now, I understand um, going back to um, um, the late 1900s or maybe even the mid-1900s, Jones actually had a, a herd of, uh, I can't remember if he called them beefalo or cattalo in, in southern Utah, I think, House Rock Valley maybe that's Arizona, that wandered over into um, today's Grand Canyon National Park and that you could actually visibly see some of the impacts of that, uh, those tests that he ran. You certainly can. I've been there and I've seen some of those animals. And he got some investors to help him with that project and he was going to start raising beefalo, cattalo there. And then at some point the, the project failed, his investors pulled out, and so did so did Charles Jones, and he left the animals out there, and they're still there today. And as a matter of fact, that they they now are on uh, National Park Service uh, lands there on the northern rim of the Grand Canyon. It's a problem because there there clearly are um, hybrid animals there, and you can you can actually, if you're lucky enough to see them, in some cases you can see some pretty strange looking animals there. That's what I've heard. I've seen pictures, but I've never been able to spot them when I was down on the North Rim. Now, there's a concern about cattle genes in today's bison conservation herds. I know um, up in Montana at the American Prairie Reserve, where they're trying to restore um, um, the, the grasslands, temperate grasslands, they want to bring back bison, and they're really um, meticulous in the, in the bison that they, they want to return there. And um, once upon a time, I believe they would obtain some bison from Wind Cave National Park in South Dakota, um, but then they became concerned that those bison might have um, cattle genes in them, cattle, cattle gene introgression. And so they, they turned north to um, Canada, um, Elk Island National Park, I believe, which actually got its original bison from um, a private herd, um, private 19th century herd that was raised just outside of today's Glacier National Park. But what, what's the great concern of, of having cattle genes in bison? I mean, if it looks like a bison and walks like a bison, isn't it a bison? Yeah, I think it is a bison. Um, I, you know, what we have, what we've been able to 
determine is that there there is a legacy of what those guys did 100 120 years ago and now it's been multiple multiple generations since that event but there's still signatures of introgression in many bison that existed from over 100 years ago so how important it is it's it's not really the importance is not how much cattle introgression there is in bison the important is what is there what genes are there from cattle and it has there over the last hundred years been selection for or against any of these cattle traits and so that's what's important and that's a question that we really don't know because we really haven't had the opportunity to look at selection in bison through their genomes what we do know what is clear is that bison have in some cases cattle mitochondrial dna and we've known that for a long time that was identified probably 25 years ago and there's been a number of studies done to look at the biological significance of that and and basically what we found when we looked at feedlot studies we looked at for example bison at santa catalina island which would be on a pretty low nutrition plane compared to a feedlot that would be a high nutrition plane what we found was that bison with cattle mitochondrial DNA were smaller and probably converted energy less efficiently. So I feel like, and I think other biologists feel like, if you have bison that have cattle mitochondrial DNA, that's pretty easy to identify. We only need a couple hair follicles to do it. And it's a really cheap test. And people probably should identify the animals that have cattle mitochondrial DNA, especially if you're in a production environment, because those animals are going to be smaller. And if you're trying to produce bison, then, you know, why, why would you want to perpetuate cattle mitochondrial DNA? And mitochondrial DNA is unusual because it's only inherited from the mother to the offspring. And, um, you know, as we all learned in high school, mitochondria are the powerhouse of the cell. So that's where we produce all of our energy. And if you have the wrong species mitochondrial DNA and a background of nuclear genes that are from bison, then it can cause problems in energy production. And so I think that from a mitochondrial standpoint, there is evidence that you don't want to perpetuate bison with mitochondrial DNA that, from cattle. The good thing is the U.S. federal herds don't have that problem. So we've we've done an extensive study in the U.S. federal herds, U.S. Fish and Wildlife herds, and National Park Service herds. And uh, to my knowledge today, there are no cattle mitochondrial DNAs in any of the U.S. federal bison herds. Now, now looking at that uh, 2020 um, Interior Department report on uh, the bison in the federal herds, um, I, I believe it mentioned that there were small levels of integration in, in the Book Cliffs, Utah herds, and, and Wrangell St. Elias bison herds so that wasn't mitochondrial dna integration um honestly i don't i don't know for sure about that herd i don't remember each individual herd it could be mitochondrial dna we also have had some markers in the nuclear genome that did define bison from cattle chromosomal regions in the nuclear genome that we've used in the past and uh, whoever did that study i'm not sure if we did it or someone else did it but it could be mitochondrial DNA. It could be a few, a handful, a limited number of nuclear markers that could identify introgression. Now, now the mitochondrial DNA, that's, that's relatively easy to, to eliminate from a herd by getting rid of the, the, the breeding females that carry it? Well, that's one way to do it. Um, some people, production bison uh, owners or managers have decided that uh, they do want to try to get rid of cattle mitochondrial DNA in their bison herd. So basically what you do is the males can't, can't pass it on to their offspring. Okay, so the males are an, a dead end when it comes to mitochondrial DNA. It doesn't come with the sperm. It only comes with the egg cell. And so the bulls, the males really don't matter much. The females, you know, you can keep their bull calves in the herd, but you just don't keep their heifer calves in your herd if you want to keep that cow. So there are management strategies you can use to eventually, over a time period of about a generation, remove all the cattle mitochondrial DNA from your herd without significantly impacting any genetic diversity parameters in that herd. So I'm wondering, um, 
knowing that genetics and, and knowing that uh, what was found in that 2020 report, does, does it provide a, a clear roadmap for, for placing bison herds elsewhere on public lands in the U.S.? I mean, obviously you want to you want to take the, the best um, um, genes from descending from those five um, or six um, foundational herds and, and blend them together, I guess, as opposed to risk inbreeding with just, you know, one one stream of DNA or genetics, rather. Yeah, I suppose. We, um, we do know that those five foundation herds did have some genetic differences among them. The most unique of those five foundation herds was Charles Goodnight's herd here in Texas because it was the only Southern Plains bison herd that made it through that population bottleneck. So we do know that there are some differences there. I think the the overriding concern from a genetic standpoint in establishing new herds is making sure that you establish those herds with high and healthy levels of genetic diversity. And we don't worry about individual genes really and selecting for or against individual genes in bison but we look at it more from a population standpoint. We look at it from a more of a global standpoint and making sure that animals that are used to establish new populations have a healthy level of genetic diversity compared to other bison populations. And I think that's more important than concerning ourselves with, you know, selecting the right genes or the wrong genes to be in a new bison herd. And so um, having those five or or six foundational herds, that's, enough diversity if um, you're careful in how you bring them together in a, in a future herd down the road, so to speak? Well, if you think about it a little bit, I think from a bison conservation perspective, we, as, as far as humans go, we are extremely lucky, and so is bison, that the history of bison happened the way that it did. So if let's just think about the scenario. What if the only bison that survived that population crash of the 1870s, 1880s was the animals that derived from six, five or six animals that Charles Goodnight had in Texas? Had that been the case, we would have gone from millions of animals down to five or six animals, and we would have lost a tremendous amount of genetic diversity in, in bison, in the species. It may have recovered, Okay, and we still may have bison today, but there would be a lot less genetic diversity in those bison than we find today. But luckily, that's not what happened. What happened was we had people in Kansas and we had people in South Dakota and we had people in Montana and and cattlemen in Alberta. They were all collecting animals in their local areas and then preserving and propagating them. So I think one reason that bison have survived that bottleneck and then inbred their way out of that low population size and now are thriving the way that they are on federal lands and private lands. The reason that they are thriving today and the reason that they have the amount of genetic diversity they do is because of what happened in that population bottleneck in the 1880s and the way that those animals were selected across most of North America. So I think we're really lucky. We're really lucky that bison survived the way they did. And I don't think it was planned. I just think it happened. But I think it's very lucky the way that it did happen. Yeah, definitely interesting. We're talking today with Dr. Jim Durr, a professor of veterinary genetics at Texas A&M University, who has spent more than a quarter century directing worldwide research projects in wildlife and livestock conservation genetics. Um, We're going to take a short break, and we'll be back to take a closer look at the Yellowstone situation and the bison herds up there. In addition to some of the best rates in the country, Interior Federal Credit Union gives back their members more than other financial institutions in the form of dividends and low or no fees. With higher dividend rates, you can earn more in all your accounts, like certificates, money markets, or even a checking account. They focus to make sure that their members aren't being nickeled and dimed every time they make a transaction That's the beauty of Interior Federal Credit Union. The Grand Teton National Park Foundation is a private, nonprofit organization that supports projects that protect and enhance Grand Teton National Park's cultural, historic, and natural resources. By funding initiatives that go beyond what the National Park Service could accomplish on its own, foundation donors improve the visitor experience and provide benefits to the national park system for decades to come. 
See their successes at gtnpf.org. Wild Tribute is lifestyle apparel founded for our parks and public lands. We donate 4% of our proceeds to support America's most wild and historic places. This is our Wild Tribute. Together, we can and will make a difference for the parks. You can learn more at wildtribute.com. The Blue Ridge Parkway Foundation is the primary nonprofit fundraising partner for the Blue Ridge Parkway. It is made up of people who have a deep love for this majestic road and want to ensure that its natural beauty and the experiences it offers endure for generations to come. Show your appreciation at brpfoundation.org. Washington State is graced with three spectacular national parks, each different and special in their own unique ways. As the official nonprofit partner and the only philanthropic organization dedicated exclusively to supporting these parks through charitable contributions, Washington's National Park Fund has a mission to raise private support to deepen everyone's love for, understanding of, and experiences in Mount Rainier, North Cascades, and Olympic National Parks. Share your passion for these parks at WNPF.org. All right, we're back today with Dr. Jim Durr talking about bison in general and Yellowstone bison specifically. Jim, Yellowstone National Park is embarking on an environmental impact statement to examine how best to manage its bison herds. Um, Park staff told me that that is needed because of new information and changed circumstances since the 2000 um, Interagency Bison Management Plan was approved more than 20 years ago. Now, some of those uh, premises regarding disease transmission in the initial plan were either incorrect or have changed over time, I was told. In addition, fewer cattle are near the park, and federal and state disease regulators have taken steps to lessen the economic impacts of brucellosis outbreaks in cattle. Can you tell me what new information um, has come up that prompted this EIS in Yellowstone? You know, I'm not privy to all the information that the people, that, the biologists at Yellowstone National Park have. I mean, all I really know in any detail is the genetic information that I've been involved in. I know that um, Natalie Halbert, who was a PhD student of mine, had a project where we looked at all of the U.S. federal herds and looked at genetic diversity in those herds. And as part of that project, you know, back in the middle 2000, 2005, 2006, when most of that research was going on, 2007. Um, Yellowstone National Park was part of that. And we did a population level assessment of the bison in Yellowstone at that time using some nuclear markers called microsatellite markers. And, but, you know, that, that study was done 15 or so years ago now. And my understanding is based on some of the information the biologists have in Yellowstone that, that, Animal movements in Yellowstone are a little different now than they were before we did that study. Yeah, I was kind of curious about about that point. Um, I'm just wondering if it had a connection with with climate change because if there's less snow, it's easier for bison to move around. I, I don't know. I'm just throwing throwing something out there. I know um, Mary Marr, um, Park Service uh, researcher for many years in Yellowstone, once told me that. Um, you know, with the advent of, of winter recreation in Yellowstone, the um, the grooming of park roads for snowmobiling um, made it really easy for for bison that um, perhaps once might have been um, overwintered in the interior of the park um, could could move around more. A any guess on on whether those two factors, the grooming of roads and and possibly less severe winters under climate change, has uh, allowed those uh, bison herds to intermingle more than in the past? Well, I mean, you know, I, I'm not on the ground in Yellowstone and I'm not a biologist there. So, I, you know, I don't see that stuff every day, but it's, it makes sense. You know, it seems kind of logical that that kind of thing could happen because what Natalie Halbert and I found that we reported in 2012 was that there were two populations in Yellowstone. And those two populations weren't completely reproductively isolated from each other. That That wasn't what we found, but we did find that there were two subpopulations in Yellowstone that appeared to be interbreeding populations that more or less stayed together from a genetic standpoint. And that was kind of news back then because nobody had really seen that before in Yellowstone National Park. 
And we felt like it probably had something to do with the fact that there were some native bison in Yellowstone National Park in the early 1900s. And then there were some introduced bison that came in from outside the park. And maybe that was that subdivision was a reflection of what had happened 100 years ago in, that, in Yellowstone when it was established. So we didn't know that for a fact, but we all we just knew that there appeared to be two subpopulations in Yellowstone that are more or less isolated from each other. Yeah, and that comes into play um, today in the news um, when it comes to Yellowstone bison, uh, the possibility that there are two genetically distinct herds in the park. There has been a lawsuit seeking to force the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to designate Yellowstone bison is either threatened or endangered under the Endangered Species Act, uh, and that raises that possibility about the genetically distinct herds, and if there are two genetically distinct herds, do we have to manage them for larger numbers than the park currently is is managing? I think somebody threw out that, you know, if the northern herd is 3,000 animals and the, the this other central herd is 3,000 animals, each of those should be managed for more than 3,000. And so you could um, possibly double the, the bison numbers in, in Yellowstone. What, what do you think about that? I mean, um, you know, based on your research with Natalie. Well, based on my research with Natalie, we, we were highly concerned about how separate those two herds are, how genetically unique those two herds are. And so Natalie and I, and our co-authors spent quite a bit of time trying to figure out how much migration there was from one herd to the other, from one subpopulation in Yellowstone to the other. And there's, there's a field of population genetics that allow you to estimate gene flow between two different populations. And, and so we used, we, we used that kind of technology and we acknowledged that there was gene flow between the central herd and the northern herd in Yellowstone. We, we acknowledge that there was gene flow between those two, but the point of the study was that it's limited. And what we didn't know that in that paper that we published in 2012 was, is this a reflection of the native bison that were in Yellowstone and the introduced bison in Yellowstone and how they just haven't totally mixed over the last hundred years or not? And so then subsequent to that, uh, I had a different graduate student, David Forgus, and, and he and I decided that we would take some bison samples that we had, and we had some new technology because we had sequenced the genome of mitochondrial DNA in the interim between Natalie's work and David's work. And we decided to apply that to, to population subdivision in Yellowstone. And so we did. And I, it's and Incredibly cool that we can do this, but we sequenced the mitochondrial genome of a bison, of some bison from Yellowstone, and we can identify the ancestral mitochondrial haplotype that is native to the Yellowstone landscape. So we know what that is. We know what that mitochondrial is. And we can also identify the mitochondrial DNA that came with some bison cows from the Pablo Allard herd in Western Montana. That is a totally different mitochondrial DNA sequence. And those two sequences and, and some variation between the two, but for the most part, those two major clades exist in Yellowstone National Park. Now you'll remember, Kurt, you know this well, there were three bison that were brought from Charles Goodnight bulls to help reestablish Yellowstone National Park. However, remember mitochondrial DNA and the bulls don't pass it on. So although those three bulls brought Texas mitochondrial DNA to Yellowstone National Park, it no longer exists in the park because those bulls, even though at least two of them were breeders in the park, they can't pass on their mitochondrial DNA. So what I thought about, my thoughts were, you know what? Maybe the Western Montana mitochondrial type and the native Yellowstone mitochondrial type track with the two herds that we saw in Natalie Halbert's work five or six years earlier. So David Forges did a study. We looked at where those animals were and what herd we thought they belonged to and compared that to their mitochondrial status. And what David Forges found was that the mitochondrial status, although clearly was different, didn't track with the subpopulations that Natalie had seen. 
And in talking with the biologist in Yellowstone and looking at their radio collar data and the information they had on movements in the park, they said that things are changing in the park and animals are moving and spending more time in different places in the park than they had in the past. And so there is the potential that Natalie's study, which was perfectly valid for 15 years ago, and found two, two different populations that were fairly well distinct in the park, David Forgus, a study that came along actually about eight or so years later, um, found that those two populations were starting to break down. So the fact of the matter is, I don't really know for sure how much that subdivision in Yellowstone still exists, but I do know that we have a new study going on with Yellowstone. We have sampled animals in in the central herd and in the northern herd during the breeding season. And then we've sampled those animals at the, at the border of the park at West Yellowstone and at Garner. And we're using microsatellite DNA, the same as Natalie Halbert did. And we're also using some new markers that are more powerful markers for bison and determining population subdivision. They're called single nucleotide polymorphism markers or SNP markers that we have developed from genome sequencing of bison projects that we've been involved in in the last five or six years. So we are reevaluating what Natalie Halbert found as far as population subdivision in Yellowstone today. I mean, that project is ongoing right now. I have a graduate student, his name is Sam Stroop, that is working on that project. Um, that's part of his dissertation project. And I, I suspect that uh, Sam's planning to graduate in December of this year, December of 2022 and uh, all the samples are collected. Some of the data have been collected. We're in the middle of collecting the rest of the data and doing the analysis uh, as we speak. So looking at those two herds and, and maybe that's a, a general statement, two herds, um, the, the central herd and the northern herd, is the central herd still primarily made up of the native stock to Yellowstone? You know, actually that was the whole thought. That was what we believed at the time. And, um, I don't have any evidence uh, any different that it's not, but I just don't know if the gene flow between the northern and central herd has changed in the last 15 years. And so that's what we hope to find out here in the next, in the near future with, uh, with Sam's dissertation work. Now, if there are two clearly genetically distinct herds, do you want to maintain them or would you want to see more crossing of the genes to strengthen the genetic pool, so to speak? You know, I think I, I would lean towards letting those bison take care of themselves. I think they've taken care of themselves for 120 years or thousands of years, actually. Yeah. Um, I realize that we put constraints on the bison, but, um, you know, I, I'm, I would think I would want to try to force the situation one way or the other. The fact of the matter is, again, we are lucky in Yellowstone because the herd sizes are large. So, you know, the northern herd probably has somewhere around 3,000 animals in it. I don't know exactly what the census size is. The central herd has something over 1,000 animals in it, maybe over 1,200 animals in it. These are fairly, in a comparative way, large herds. As a matter of fact, if you compare these two populations to the other National Park Service herds, like Wind Cave, for example, that central herd, which is the smallest one, is twice as large as the census size at Wind Cave National Park. So we're lucky in Yellowstone from a genetics perspective and conservation of genetics, of genetic uh, diversity. We are lucky that those Yellowstone herds are as large as they are. Because from a population genetic standpoint, the larger the herd, the more breeding individuals there are in the herd, the bigger your insurance policy is against the loss of genetic diversity. So, you know, I, I personally am not overly worried about either one of these herds and the loss of diversity because I don't think that th there's no evidence that what's going on there right now is resulting in that. I think the latest uh, census number I saw was roughly 5,000 bison in all of Yellowstone. Um, I'm not sure how the breakdown is, but let's say, you know, there's 3,000 in the northern herd and, and you know, 1,200 or 1,500 in the central herd. If 
it comes back that they're, they're genetically distinct and we need to manage for those genetics. And so we should double the size of those herds. Um, so 6,000 animals in the northern herd, 3,000 animals in the, the central herd. Can the park hold more than 5,000 bison and, and should it? I mean, there's an argument I've, I've heard that Yellowstone's landscape never traditionally held that many bison to start with. And so managing it for thousands of bison might not be compatible with what the landscape historically held. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if that's if that's fact. It's pretty harsh country in the middle of the winter there with all the snowfall that they get. And uh, I'm not a I'm not an ecologist, and so you know it's not the kind of work that I do to to concern myself about what the carrying capacity is for a particular property. But from what I understand. 5,000 animals is a lot of a lot of animals at Yellowstone National Park today. And I think if we doubled that or did something even more, I think the ecological problems would probably even outweigh the genetic problems if if that happened. Well, what sort of ecological problems would you foresee? Well, you know, overpopulation, overuse of the resource, more animals wanting to leave the park and causing problems outside the park. Um, and when you pack more animals into to the same existing size space, there's always a chance that disease becomes more of an issue. Those animals are closer together. They can't get enough uh, part. And then nutrition becomes a problem with them too. So I think overpopulation has all kinds of consequences to it that uh, that would not be good for Yellowstone bison. Yeah, yeah. Uh, going forward, it's going to be interesting to watch um, what is compiled to this EIS on, on managing bison in Yellowstone. Uh, are you playing a role in that? Or are you a, a bystander as well? I guess we're playing a role in it to a limited degree because we are reevaluating Natalie Halbert's subpopulation study in a more modern time period, so 15 or so years later. Um, so we're playing a role there, but as far as playing a role legally, um, no, I, I'm not. I, that's pretty much not the role that I play. I do the research, publish the papers, and try to explain what we found, and then let others deal with the legalities as best I can. Now, going back to uh, Interior Secretary Kemp Thorne back in 2008, I mean, he, he had this vision of, of placing more bison on public lands in the, in the West and the Midwest. Are we seeing that happen? I know American Prairie Reserve up in northern Montana, although that's not exactly federal lands. Um, I know they're trying to stitch some some federal lands into um, their plans. Um, are, are we at the point where we're seeing um, bison herds crop up anywhere else on a public landscape? Um, I think so. I think that the interest in people um, having bison on properties has increased. I know the National Bison Association has a has a major program that's been out for a couple of years now, trying to grow the, the herd, trying to increase the number of bison in North America to over a million animals. That they still have a ways to go in doing that, but uh, that that the North American Bison Association aspires to that. Um, there are um, a lot of new private bison producers out there. I don't know that there are that many new public herds, that large public herds that have been established, but I know there are some efforts, for example, a really good effort with the Nature Conservancy in making a metapopulation situation with Yellowstone National Park. And so the Nature Conservancy has partnered with, Yell with uh, Wind Cave National Park and they have established five satellite herds that are exclusively Wind Cave National Park bison. And what they have done actually is, I think it's really cool. They have increased the effective population size of Wind Cave National Park by 100%. So they have doubled the effective population size of Wind Cave National Park with an NGO, the, the Nature Conservancy partnering with the National Park Service because Wind Cave National Park doesn't have any more carrying capacity to to expand their herd on site. So they had to partner with Nature Conservancy mm -hmm. to do that. And I think it's been a very successful program for them, yeah. for both Nature Conservancy and the Park Service. I know Badlands has its own population of bison, and I think they might have new or, or more capacity out there. The, the only other location I can think of off the top of my head is, is Great uh, Sand Dunes National Park and Preserve in, in Colorado. And, of course, there is a, um, 
a, a bison herd down there on a, a neighboring ranch that uh, those bison come into the, the park. But I, I believe there's um, a problem with cattle intergression there. And so the plan that the, the Park Service has put forth is, you know, eventually we'll have to get rid of those bison and then bring in some more genetically sound animals, I believe, from, well, whether that's from Wind Cave or Yellowstone or Badlands or a mix from all those. I, I'm kind of curious on how that's going forward. Yeah, I, I don't know how the how the repopulation will occur there, to tell you the truth. That that private population or NGO population is a nature conservancy herd. It's on the Mendoza Pata Ranch. It is a fairly large herd. There are a lot of animals, more than a thousand animals in that herd. Uh, I think much more than a thousand animals in that herd. And uh, yeah, there's some evidence that those animals have some cattle introgression in them. That is true. But I don't know that that completely and fully disqualifies them from still being an important conservation herd because let's face it, you know, they're, they are 99% or more bison genetics in that herd. And bison mitochondrial DNA has pretty much been dealt with in that herd over the years by the Nature Conservancy. So that although there might still be some cattle mitochondrial DNA there, I think it's pretty limited. I think the Nature Conservancy has been a very good steward of that, that herd at Mendoza Potter Ranch. And um, I don't know what's going to happen with the Great Sand Dunes. And, and I mean, that's been a discussion for now 20 years as to what may happen there. And uh, I don't I don't know. I know from a genetic standpoint what we've done, but I don't know from a political standpoint what will happen. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, politics will rule the day, I'm sure. Well, Jim, it's been fun talking about bison and uh, the Yellowstone herd and, and the future of bison in North America. Um, as of today, it sounds like things are, are going well and in the right direction. Is that safe to say? I would say um, there's never been a better time to be interested in bison than there is right now. I think the interest in bison um, for conservation from on the federal side is high. I think a lot of people are interested. I think the North American bison becoming the U.S. national mammal was incredible. I think it's a wonderful thing that has happened to the species. And um, it, you know, it raises it even to a higher level in the consciousness of people. And I think that on the production side, the number of bison that are out there that people are, are conserving and producing is a good thing. And then on the technology side, we've never had the kind of technology, obviously, that we have today with genomics and mammals. And our ability to be able to learn things about populations like subdivision in Yellowstone that, that we learned almost a decade ago now. But those kinds of questions that we can ask that are directly involved in conservation of this species has never been better than it is today because we have these tools, these scientific tools that let us ask difficult questions and get fairly clear cut answers as to what's going on in these populations. So honestly, I'm highly encouraged. I am uh, happy to be in a position that we are in using technology to help bison conservation into the future. And um, I think it's a pretty fun place to be. It's definitely interesting, and it'll be interesting to see what this uh, EIS up in Yellowstone shows um, down the road and, and whether we do need more bison in Yellowstone. Anyway, thanks again, sir, and uh, we'll look forward to uh, your forthcoming research and, and what light that sheds on um, bison herds in North America. You bet, Kurt. Thank you very much. That's our show for this week. We hope you enjoyed it. With that show, we've concluded our third consecutive year of bringing you news, features, discussion, and commentary about national parks and public lands. We hope you've enjoyed those 157 episodes as much as we have enjoyed pulling them together for you. Your interest in our weekly podcasts have them ranked among the top 2% of the world's 2.7 million active podcasts. Thanks so much for listening in every week. For The Traveler, this is Kurt Repencheck. See you in the parks. The composers and musicians at Orange Tree Productions have created a unique collection known as the National Park Series that has grown to include more than 30 CD titles. Composed against the backdrop of a park's sounds of nature, these musical scores will connect you with these beautiful places and take you there, at least in your mind. 
This collection is the number one selling National Park audio series in the world and provides the background music for National Parks Travelers podcasts. Visit them at orangetreeproductions.com. Editing and production work for the National Parks Traveler podcast is done by Splitbeard Productions. You can learn more about us at splitbeardproductions.com. National Parks Traveler is a 501c3 nonprofit media organization that provides daily editorial coverage of national parks and protected areas. Traveler's coverage is made possible by reader and listener donations. Visit nationalparkstraveler.org.